he feared him because, well, his popularity was becoming greater than Saul's. Maybe he's going to take over my job. And so he made him an enemy of the state. And he became obsessed with killing David. Go ahead and read 1st and 2nd Samuel. R.T. Kendall, he said that the persecutor's main tactic is to discredit you. They will speak badly about you to your boss, keeping you from getting that promotion or raising pay. They will tell your friends about any indiscretions they might perceive in your life. They will go out of their way to keep you from succeeding and from being admired by people in the office or at church. What's more, listen, if they are Christians, they may deceive themselves into thinking they are doing it for God and His glory. In John 16, Jesus said, A time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he's offering a service to God. Now that was when persecution against the Christians became physical in nature. It, and it actually still is in many places in the world. Uh, we don't hear about it. You see, we're isolated here in the United States. We don't hear about the tremendous persecutions that are being done in Africa. Uh, I get some privileged information. My niece lives down in Nairobi, so I hear about some of the things that take place down there. She told me about some of her students that suddenly stopped coming into class because, well, they were, they were killed because they were Christians. And um, some say that persecution is unprecedented right now in the history of the world. But we're isolated. We don't hear about it. We don't see about it. It's not something CNN or CNBC or any of those places want to advertise. In a lot of places today, it's a very dangerous thing to say you're a Christian. You're taking your life in your hands. In our day, and in our culture, our enemies, they don't kill with the sword or the gun, but with the tongue and the pen. And social media. If you do have enemies, understand that, that most likely they're going to pursue you. To discredit you. But God is great. And He's also promised us that if you can stand with Him, if you can follow Him, that He's guaranteeing that there are going to be people out there that will hate you. Not because you're bad, not because you did something bad to them, but because you're standing for what is good. And that's because the enemy of our souls and of God now hates you because you're giving Christ a good name. So he is striving after you. He is pursuing you because you're striving to follow Christ and make him known. And our real enemy hates that, so he's going to work double time to manipulate and come after you to knock you down and knock you out. But here's the deal. God has a plan for our lives. A plan to prosper us, a plan to, to, to bring us through. And God promised us, greater is he that is within you than he that is within the world. Keep looking up because he is a plan. And our enemies, listen, our enemies are part of the plan. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4, he said, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. So the bottom line is, if you have enemies, you are blessed. Blessed. That doesn't happen to everyone. David needed a soul. 
Because of Saul, David had to hide. David had to search his soul. David grew close to God and understood that only in God's strength could he go on. David had his bad times later on when he forgot all those lessons and that he learned on the run from Saul when he was with Bathsheba and sent Uriah out to be killed. We see David the miserable, David the man that needs to be thrown in prison. But let's not, let's not, let's not take that area of his life and apply it to the whole. Let's not allow that to be how we think of him because we all, if we're honest, have had times in our life when we didn't trust, when we didn't act right. We all have sinned and gone astray at times. And, and, and if you say you never have, then John tells us that means you're a liar and the truth isn't in you. That's what we're told in the Bible. But thank God that we have His grace to fall back on us. You may have had those bad moments early in your life, maybe in the middle, maybe you're struggling with them now. But here's the encouraging part. God sees your life and my life as one whole. You see, we see it as a line. And I was bad here, I was bad here. God sees it all in one shot and says it is good. And he knows our past, our present, and our future. God sees all your life together, and here's the thing. He still loves you. He still loves you. He still forgives you. Here's the worst, the, 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 the most awesome thing. He still wants to bless you. David needed a Saul, which in turn helped shape him to become a king. Who knows? If David never had a Saul, maybe the way he was with Bathsheba and Uriah would have been his whole kingship legacy. But it wasn't because he had a Saul in his life. Saul helped to temper him. Saul helped to draw him to the Lord. And by the way, I don't know how many of you know this, David had this legion of men. They were called David's mighty men. Legendary. These men came to David when he was hiding in caves from Saul. One by one, they came to David. The mighty men of David, the mighty fighting force that is legend, came to David while he was hiding from Saul in a cave. <clears throat> and they found a man that would accept them, as they are, warts and all. Fierce army of the most brave, courageous soldiers was developed while he ran away from his enemy's soul. You see the thing. God has a plan for each of us, and his plan is to turn bad into good, and his plan is to use your enemies to help shape you so that you can be ready for the mission that he has for you. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, he said, the worst thing that can happen to a man is to succeed before he is ready. R.T. Kendall said, God did David a special favor. He raised up Saul to keep him on his toes, to teach him to be sensitive to the spirit, and to teach him total forgiveness. Saul was David's passport to his greater anointing. 
And I don't know if any of you remember the story, David was hiding in a cave with his mighty men. And Saul came into the cave as he was pursuing David. And he came into the cave to relieve himself. And David snuck over to him, and all his mighty men are thinking, yep, you're going to plunge that knife right into his gut, and it's going to all going to be over. And David said, far be it for me to touch God's anointing. God had put Saul in place. God would take Saul out of place. And David believed God, so he believed that. So he cut off a little piece of his garment. Later on, he showed it. To Saul to prove that he wasn't trying to kill Saul and it wasn't Saul's enemy. And at that point, in that particular battle, Saul left. Until next time, the anger took over and he pursued David again. But David consistently didn't go against Saul. And I believe that was because he forgave him because he knew that God had placed him where he was. And that fierce faith in his God allowed him to extend that forgiveness, even to his enemy. Total forgiveness means forgiving our enemies. And before we talk about that um, and get into it a little bit more, let me address another issue. There are some of us who uh, whom we will be called to forgive, but they aren't really our enemies. They've hurt us. They've done us wrong, yes, but not knowing. And if they did hurt us, it wasn't intentionally. Some people are actually trying to help. At least that's their intention. They might not have said something hurt. They may have said something hurtful, but uh, because they felt that you needed to hear it. Were they right? No. But was it intentional? No. They honestly didn't say it to hurt you. They said it because they thought it was the right thing to do. <coughs> I can remember in my past I had somebody who uh, was very involved with ministry with me. And uh, we served at the same uh, church. We grew really close. Uh, I thought it I thought it was he was one of those friends for life, you know? And suddenly he left the ministry. I, I didn't understand why. I mean, I, I called him up. I, I, I tried to get information out of him, but I, I really didn't get any kind of reason. And I tried to keep in touch, but that didn't work either. And it was just a one-way relationship. And you know how one-way relationships are. They just kind of don't last long. Now, I don't know if this person was trying to hurt me. I don't believe they were. Did they? Yes. Yeah. And I honestly still have no idea what, what it was all about. I lost a friend, and I don't have any idea why. Does that hurt? Yeah. Does, <coughs> did it make me angry? Sometimes it did. Anyone we have anger toward, we need to forgive because it, it's not about them, it's about us. And it's about our own freedom. We need to forgive because we need healing. It's a bit of a selfish thing, forgiveness. I think it's harder to forgive those people who are not our enemies but have hurt us unintentionally. And I, I think those are the kind of hurts that cut a little bit deeper. Forgiving an enemy almost seems somewhat easy compared to somebody who's close to us and hurts us. 
but total forgiveness is about that. R.T. Kendall said, the greater the hurt, the greater the blessing that will come with forgiveness. But we'll have enemies, especially if we're seeking God in our life. Some people might be an enemy just because you're doing the right thing and they don't like you for it. Isn't it encouraging? Jesus told us that in this world we're going to have trouble. And Jesus told us that people are going to hate you because you love me. Not because we did anything wrong, but just because we're committed to Christ. <coughs> Matthew 5 uh, says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecute the prophets who were before you. If you want to have enemies because of your relationship with Jesus Christ, you are in an elite group. Elite. According to Kendall, when we have totally forgiven our enemy, he says, you have crossed over into a supernatural realm. For miraculous things, there is no natural explanation, right? We call something a miracle. There's no natural explanation. It's a miracle. But we don't stop and think that forgiveness is supernatural. It's not natural to forgive your enemy. It's not. And so, when we do, it's just as much a miracle as Jesus walking on the water. There's no natural explanation. And you don't need a seminary degree. You don't need Bible college education. You don't need to be brilliant. You don't need to be charismatic. You just have to be willing to follow Christ at His Word. And if we do, we can do something very, very rare. Forgive an enemy. And when we do, not only does that miracle happen in us, but often it happens to everybody around us. Why do we have enemies? When Jesus told us to love our enemies, to forgive them, there's the assumption that we're all going to have them in our lives. And don't assume that they will be people who are against your beliefs. <coughs> Many will be within the community of faith. I have to be honest with you. My greatest enemies were probably those that were in my churches. And that's a sad thing to say, but I'm just being honest with you. The issues that cause conflicts may not be theological at all. Just because the person just plain doesn't like you. There might be no fault of your own, but remember who's at work. And yes, the enemy of our souls, he wants to bring us down, but God has allowed it in your lives. Why? Because there's a purpose behind it. There's always a purpose. And he allows it so that you can become what he wants you to become, just like he allowed Saul into David's life. God wants you to stay the course. He wants you to succeed. So he allows those difficult things into our lives and those difficult people into our lives to strengthen our faith. He gives us some wise, wise advice for staying the course. Psalms 37, he says, Delight yourselves in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Now, isn't it interesting? You have desires in your heart right now. And he says, if you delight yourself in the Lord, He will give you those desires of your heart. But I, I think you need to look at what happens first. When we delight ourselves in the Lord, He begins to shape the desires of our heart. And the desire of our heart becomes, I want to please you, Father. And He gives us that. And He blesses us. 
Delight yourselves in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. We all want the desires of our heart to be there. So the key is to delight ourselves in the Lord. 1 Peter 5, 6, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that He may lift you up in due time. Humble yourself. Put yourself in a humble position. Put yourself in a submissive position. Say, Lord, I surrender to you. I'm done trying to live my life my way because I mess it up. So my life is now your life. Tell me what it is. I'm yours. And God, I think when we come to that place, smiles at us and says, oh, do I have blessings for you? R.T. Kendall said, whether your enemy, whether your enemy is temporary or a life sentence, never forget that God's at the bottom of it all. Listen, your enemy can be your co-worker, your friend, maybe even a family member, a child, a parent, a wife, a husband. And what goes on, he says, your enemy's objective is to punish you any way he can, to put you in your place, to keep you checked. They think that if they don't do this, then it won't be done. They may even feel that they are an instrument of God, that they are an instrument God will use to put you in your place. But while their motives may be carnal, listen, God's purpose is our sanctification. God's purpose is to build us up, make us complete, lacking nothing. It's amazing what happens when we take him at his word on this. I had a guy named Roy in the first church I was ever at. And I worked with... Uh, at that time, 20s, 30s, 40s, it, basically a single group. I didn't like to call it a single group because that sounded like that's really looking at people, you know. <laughs> so we kind of got away from that. We just called it college in um, And it started off small, just me and a few people having a Bible study. And because I was a brand new Christian, you see, and I just I just wanted to talk about Jesus because I fell in love with him. I surrendered my life to him, and I was just, you know, you, you could knock me down because I was just like, so excited about this new life. And so we would have this Bible study, and lo and behold, uh, after uh, several months, suddenly there was 25 people coming to this Bible study. And I didn't know what that was, but I just did my best. And uh, a little while later, there was 50, 60 people coming. And we had this Bible, like, Bible study every Tuesday night. And Every Tuesday night, we would have our Bible study, and we would have a main session where we would sing a couple songs, and then we would have a, I would give a little teaching, and then we would break into these small groups, and I had several small groups, and they would go into different rooms in our the bottom of our church where we had all our Sunday school groups. And every Wednesday, I would get a call from Roy, and I would be told. You had three lights that you left on. The doors weren't shut, Dave. The doors need to be shut in every room so that the heat doesn't get lost. Okay, Roy, I'm sorry. I, 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 I think better. You know, not. Next week, we had the Bible study. Tuesday night, Wednesday, I get a call from Roy. Dave, the bathroom lights were on. We can't be having this. And we, had a, we used to have a volleyball night once a month, and we'd get 100 to 200 people coming to the volleyball line. It was amazing. I remember the first time we had it, I had this friend of mine, Pete, that was going to share his testimony, and we just invited, you know, the Bible study, and all of a sudden, 80 people walked through the door, and I look at Pete, and I go, we need more bagels. <laughs> and sure enough, lights would get left on, and Roy came up to me the next week and said, Dave, because he left lights on and kind of had them all in a row, told me what I did. And he said, and most of those people, a lot of those people, they don't come to our church. And I said, Roy, isn't that what it's supposed to be all about? 
interesting thing, that went on for about a year. And each time, I didn't get angry with Roy. I tried to appease him. I tried to be respectful, and I was. And then one day, I came in, the senior pastor of the church called me and said, hey, what, what did you say to Roy? And I said, Bob, I didn't say anything to him. I just, you know, he says a lot of things to me. <laughs> I just told him I'd do better. He, was, he broke down in a Bible study lesson. And he asked prayer, and he said, he's been so hard on you. And he asked for forgiveness. I was shocked. Do you know that Roy, Roy became one of my greatest advocates. And after that time, in Roy's eyes, I could do no wrong. When we forgive our enemies and love them, we make them a friend. <coughs> Saul was after David, but Saul in the New Testament was after Christians. So Jesus met him and made him a friend. And he became Paul. Look, Jesus died for us while we were sinners. While we were his enemies. And he went on the cross and totally forgave us. And now he calls us friends. And your enemy ceases to be your enemy when you make him or her your friend. It's easy to love and forgive people that we love. But the real test for us is when they don't like us and they look at us as their enemy and we choose to totally forgive them anyway. Christ totally forgave us and told us to go and do likewise. Easy, no. Necessary, yes. You have enemies. You are blessed. God has allowed them in your life to shape you, to bring you to a new place in your relationship with Him. God is molding you. He's working on you. There's a greater blessing. There's a greater anointing on the other side of that enemy door. But we need to open it. We need to venture into that supernatural realm called total forgiveness. Today we work on forgiving our enemies. Next week we're going to talk about loving our enemies. They're not necessarily the same thing. And Jesus tells us, you know. and he reminds us of it. Every, every morning. While we were enemies of Jesus, he died on the cross for us and totally forgave us so that we could become his friends. He wants us to do the same. Let me close in a word of prayer and then if we can have uh, a couple guys come up and hand out our elements, we'll be able to